Welcome to the Penguin Podcast. Twas the night before Christmas. Well, actually, here at the Penguin House, it really is. Right now on the Penguin Podcast, the excitement is building because tomorrow, for the purposes of this podcast episode, is Christmas. My name is Stephen Butler, author of The Wrong Pong, a series of books about a boy who gets yanked down the loo into the land of trolls and the upcoming Diary of Dennis the Menace. And I'm here on the Penguin Podcast with Penguin, Puffin and Ladybird to celebrate this very festive day. And did you know the troll word for Christmas is drool tide? Obviously, there are a few things that one really has to do on Christmas Eve. Hang one stocking by the chimney, put out a carrot for Rudolph and a tot of whiskey for Santa, and do any last-minute wrapping or panic buying. (laughs) Once all that is done, it's time to snuggle down in front of the TV with a mince pie and watch that Christmas Eve classic, The Snowman. Did you know that he's been taking us to the North Pole for over 30 years? And last year, he was joined by a new friend, the Snow Dog, for walkies in the air. Sorry. Here's Benedict Cumberbatch reading an extract from The Snowman and The Snow Dog. I'm going to make a snowman too, thought Billy. Just like his one. He took the box and ran outside and began to build his own snowman. He used two pieces of coal for the eyes and a new tangerine for the nose. And last of all, he gave him a great big smile. His snowman was perfect. But there was still plenty of snow left. Billy had an idea. He started building again and bit by bit, with two socks for ears, he made a snow dog. Do you remember when you were a tiddler? Bet you couldn't sleep on Christmas Eve. Maybe you even snuck downstairs after midnight to see if Santa was downing that whiskey. (laughs) But imagine if you peeked out the window and who should you see but... It was dark now. The night had already begun. The BFG, with Sophie sitting on his hand, hurried into the cave and put on those brilliant blinding lights that seemed to come from nowhere. He placed Sophie on the table. Stay there, please, he said, and no chittering. I is needing to listen only to silence when I is mixing up such a naughty, plexicated dream as this. He hurried away from her. He got out an enormous empty glass jar that was the size of a washing machine. He clutched it to his chest and hurried towards the shelves on which stood the thousands and thousands of smaller jars containing the captured dreams. Dreams about giants, he muttered to himself as he searched the labels. The giants is guzzling human beings. No, 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 not that one, nor that one. Here's one. Ah, here's another. He grabbed the jars and unscrewed the tops. He tipped the dreams into the enormous jar he was clutching, and as each one went in, Sophie caught a glimpse of a small sea-green blob tumbling from one jar into the other. The BFG hurried towards another shelf. Now, he muttered, I is wanting dreams about giggle houses for girls and about boggle boxes for boys. He was becoming very tense now. Sophie could almost see the excitement bubbling inside him as he scurried back and forth among his beloved jars. There must have been 50,000 dreams altogether up there on the shelves, but he seemed to know almost exactly where every one of them was. Dreams about a little girl, he muttered, and dreams about me, uh, about the BFG. Come on, come on, hurry up, get on with it. Now where in the wonky world is I keeping those? And so it went on. In about half an hour, the BFG had found all the dreams he wanted and had tipped them into the one huge jar. 
He put the jar on the table. Sophie sat watching him but said nothing. Inside the big jar, lying on the bottom of it, she could clearly see about 50 of those oval sea green jellyfish shapes, all pulsing gently in and out, some lying on top of others, but each one still a quite separate individual dream. Now he is mixing them, the BFG announced. He went to the cupboard where he kept his bottles of frobscottle, and from it he took out a gigantic egg beater. It was one of those that has a handle which you turn, and down below there are a lot of overlapping blades that go whizzing around. He inserted the bottom end of this contraption into the big jar where the dreams were lying. Watch, he said. He started turning the handle very fast. Flashes of green and blue exploded inside the jar. The dreams were being whisked into a sea-green froth. The poor things, Sophie cried. He's not feeling it, the BFG said as he turned the handle. Dreams is not like human beings or animals. They has no brains. They is made of Zosimus. After about a minute, the BFG stopped whisking. The whole bottle was now full to the brim with large bubbles. They were almost exactly like the bubbles we ourselves blow from soapy water, except that these had even brighter and more beautiful colours swimming on their surfaces. Keep watching, the BFG said. Quite slowly, the topmost bubble rose up through the neck of the jar and floated away. A second one followed, then a third, and a fourth. Soon the cave was filled with hundreds of beautifully coloured bubbles, all drifting gently through the air. It was a truly wonderful sight. It is, of course, the BFG, friend of the marvellous Roald Dahl. Dasher, Prancer, Donner, Blitzen and the rest better make sure they don't collide amongst the stars. There's probably nothing better than being a kid on Christmas morning. Here at the Penguin Podcast, we're running downstairs to see what's under the tree with Topsy and Tim. It's us, Topsy and Tim. <laughs> Hi, twins. They've been ever so busy this year filming a brand new series for CBeebies. According to Christmas tradition, opening the stockings is first up. And would you believe it, we've all received one of the new vintage Ladybird titles. Penguins got the Book of Knitting, Puffins got the Book of London, and Ladybirds got the 50th anniversary re-release of Cinderella. And I've got all three! (laughs) Must have been at the top of the nice list this year. Thanks, Santa. Here are Ronnie Fairweather and Heather Crossley to tell us a bit about vintage ladybirds and why they make such excellent stocking stuffers. Hi, I'm Ronnie Fairweather. I'm a creative director of A Little Bit of Penguin, which includes vintage ladybird, and I do brand and merchandise. And I'm Heather Crossley, and I'm the publisher on Ladybird. I look after the modern Ladybird list and also our vintage list. So what can people find at the archive at Reading University? Well, you can find all of the artwork, but you do have to request it. They have a complete set of books that you can go and look at. And there have been an awful lot of researchers recently going down and using the archive really like a social document uh, of the times. Um, It's one of the very few archive resources that Reading have that actually has pictures. So that's why I think it's gained in popularity. So what do you think it really is about vintage ladybird books that makes them so loved and treasured? Oh, I think it's the memories that they evoke. For me, I am a child of the Ladybird era, really. And um, although I didn't learn to read with Peter and Jane, I learned to read with Janet and John. Uh, I, still I are. know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think it just reminds you of your childhood. As they say, the sun was always shining. Um, but I think it is. It, it's about childhood, isn't it? And it's about kind of warm, happy memories that you have. It is. It's also about nostalgia um, and irony, I think. Mm. I think now uh, a lot of the pictures are incredibly unpolitically correct but are actually quite funny. And they show a time 
that people don't really recognise anymore. But it almost comes out of a fast show skit. And I think that is some of, some of the appeal of the series, to be honest. And of course, these books are still appealing to adults today. Adults are collecting them. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Recently, some reissues of the books have been the Ladybird Book of Knitting, the Book of London and Cinderella. How do you select which of the archive books to republish? Um, we are very selective in which ones we put out there. And usually it's um, event or anniversary led. So for Cinderella, that was first published in 1964. It was the very first of the well-loved tales and the only one to have a dust jacket. So we have just recently reissued that as part of the kind of celebration of its being 50 years old. We published it in October this year, a year before its anniversary, because we know there's kind of a pantomime moment just before Christmas and Cinderella is pretty much up there for Christmas. And then anniversary wise, we're going to be doing the Magna Carta in 2015 to time with the 800 years celebrations there. So we don't just flood the market. We're very choosy about what we put out. So this is a very simple question, but I expect not simple to answer. Um, which is your favourite vintage mm -hmm. ladybird? It's quite easy for me. It's the wise robin. It reminds me of my childhood. It's very festive. It's about Christmas. And it has one of the best lines in it about gay crackers. And I just think that's fantastic. <laughs> well, I didn't grow up with Ladybird, although I did have one Ladybird book, which was published in 1957. And it's the story of Cinderella, which isn't the same as The Well-Loved Tales. And I really like this book because, A, it was the only book I can remember having in my youth, but also because the fairy godmother reminded me of my aunt. And I was convinced for many, many times that this was my, my aunt and she used to come and see me and she bought my sister things like luminous socks from Scotland. So she was a fairy godmother, really. And whenever I look at this book, I actually think of her, although she is now long departed the planet. That's, that's really wonderful, both of you. <laughs> what about you, Charlie? What's your favourite Ladybird book? Well, my favourite Ladybird book is from when I was a kid. It's the one that I always read when I went to my nan and granddad's, and that was Puppies and Kittens. Oh. And I was never allowed a puppy or kitten, so it felt like oh. the vintage Ladybird filled that, that gap in my life. Oh, <laughs> gosh. It's quite emotional talking about that vintage Ladybird, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, there are a couple more questions, and then we'll be done. So... Which vintage ladybird, book or merchandise, should uh, everyone get in their stocking this Christmas? Well, I have to say you, you need to go out and buy the Cinderella facsimile, of course. Yeah. But in your virtual Christmas stocking, you could get some vintage ladybird me books. Download them onto your iPad yeah. and kind of interact with them that way. And uh, finally, what is your favourite illustration from one of the vintage ladybirds? Um, I have to say it's the egg from ABC. Mm, nice. It looks delicious. It's a hard, a soft boiled egg, I think. And um, it looks completely and utterly edible. It's, I think it's uh, words and pictures. Words EVA, and pictures, egg, Eve for egg. I know far too much about where these you things are. You do indeed. Um, uh, for me, I mean, there are so many and it's really wrong to pick one. But one that always makes me laugh is in Bulbs and Batteries. Uh, the <laughs> science series where children are encouraged to cut batteries apart and lick them. Uh, which is probably why we wouldn't reissue it now. Uh, but it's just a fantastic book telling you to do all kinds of dangerous things without health and safety or a protective clothing. They should be doing that in, in nursery schools across Absolutely. the country. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you very much, ladies. It's been really wonderful talking Vintage Ladybird with you today. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Did you know that a Christmas tree used to be called a Yule tree and was decorated with fruits like apples, dates and nuts? Balmy. <laughs> on Christmas morning, though, it's not what's on the tree that counts, it's what's under it. This Christmas morning on the Penguin podcast, everyone's hoping for a different annual. Penguin really fancies the Top Gear one. Puffin is hoping for the Doctor Who, and Ladybird is a big fan of a certain little pink pig. So nothing will do aside from the Peppa Pig annual, of course. Here's Penguin's Rich Haynes to talk about why annuals are so big each and every festive season. Hi, I'm Rich Haynes from Penguin Children's, and here are some of my top five highlights from this year's annuals. Number one... 
in the Skylanders official 2014 annual, all the Skylanders are making their New Year's resolutions. Can you guess which of your favourite Skylanders resolutions was these? One, I promise to be a little bit more humble this year, which will be very easy as I'm so brilliant and strong, and let's face it, handsome. Lightning rod. Number two, I promise not to electrocute dolphins while I race against them. And of course, that was Zap. Finally, I promise to keep my cool and not blow my top. Who else? The one and only Eruptor. Now, secondly, one of my other highlights is from the Lego Legends of Chima annual. This is packed full of amazing Chima trivia. So here's one of my favourite facts from the book. Do you know a story about Prince Laval? The future ruler of a lion tribe used to share his love of adventure and occasional pranks with Cragger, the crocodile prince. One day, though, when the two friends snuck into the lion temple, Laval could not stop Cragger from taking the chi. What began as an innocent prank started a chain of events that eventually led to a serious conflict between the Chima tribes. 3. The Lego Friends Annual, you can find out what your favourite colour says about you. My favourite colour is yellow, so this means Yellow is the colour for people who are joyful and spontaneous. If this is your perfect match, it means your friends think you are a likeable and trustworthy person. Number four. In the Moshi Monsters 2014 annual, has got tons and tons of gooey galleon gags. So I've got a couple to try out on you. What did Jaunty Jack cry as he fell overboard? Water way to go. What grades did McScruff get in pirate school? High seas. Number five. The official Top Gear annual, they've pitted NASCAR against Formula One. Did you know the most successful NASCAR drivers, Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt, and the most successful Formula One driver, Michael Schumacher, have all won the championship seven times? Crazy. But which motorsport will win the battle? You'll have to check out the annual to find out. And of course, our annual's lineup wouldn't be complete without the Doctor Who 50th anniversary annual. So I've got some questions for you. See if you can get these right and how big of a Whovian are you? Question number one. What year did Doctor Who first appear on TV? That is 1963. Number two, where do the Ice Warriors come from? Of course, Mars. Number three, how many hearts does a Doctor have? He has two. Number four, who controlled the robot Yeti? That was, of course, the great intelligence. And number five, what is 50 years old in 2013 and clearly the best television programme of all time? of course, has to be Doctor Who. And these are my highlights from our 2014 annuals. Hope you all have a great Christmas. Penguin, Puffin and Ladybird have all gone off to read their new books. Aren't they good? I can certainly think of a few pesky characters who would rather be getting into all sorts of mischief before dinner time. And my friend here, Mike Sterling, who is the editor-in-chief of The Beano, certainly knows who I'm talking about. I certainly do, the world's <laughs> wildest boy. And his name, and I have to give his full name because the second part's the most important part, it's Dennis the Menace. Yay, Dennis the Menace. And for a little sneaky peek for you guys, since this is the Christmas podcast, mm. uh, we'll let you into a little secret that in the books you get to see what Dennis gets up to on Christmas morning. And some of the naughty things he does, he sabotages Christmas dinner. And we won't tell you how, but you have to have a little read and see what he gets up to because it's pretty wild. Yeah, I, it's completely wild. And you know, it, it reminds me, it's like it's like the story of the, the, the menace of Christmas past because the, the menaces that <laughs> he's about to get up to in this book are, as you say, top secret. If we told you them now, Stephen would have to menace me. So, and I don't <laughs> want that to happen. But, you know, we, we, we could maybe talk a little bit about some of the things that Dennis might get up to in future or he, he's gotten up to in the past in Beano Town. Because, you know, Beano Town's a wonderful place to live and Christmas Day is a wonderful time. So what could be more wonderful than Christmas in Beano Town? Exactly. And some of the characters that might come round for Christmas dinner, because obviously in Dennis's house, it's not just mum and dad. He's got Nasha the dog. Nasha the dog. Yep. Everybody loves Nasha the dog. And, and Stephen, I have to give you a, a, a quiz question now. OK. What's Nasha's favourite food? Sausages. Correct. I had to think about that then. I had uh, to really I was think. worried there for a minute. <laughs> I, I, I was terrified you were going to say something you wasn't allowed to eat. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but Nasha's favourite food, sausages. So he loves the little sausages you get at Christmas time. <laughs> you know, the little sausages that are wrapped in little bits of bacon. But these pose a problem in the menace house because Dennis's gran also has a pet. Vrasher the pig. Yes. 
And so that's not so good because Russia, strangely, isn't so fond of bacon. So Nasha has to be quite discreet about his chomping habits on Christmas Day. That's very true. And we never know. You don't want to serve up a big old ham and it happens to be Russia's <laughs> late these, Aunt Beverly. Well, you know how they say <laughs> that you should always have the family around for Christmas dinner, yeah. but I don't think that's what no. Russia would be On expecting, the table. Stephen. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that's something for you guys to look forward to in the future. So keep your eyes open for the diary of Dennis the Menace and all the lovely things that Dennis gets up to. And um, the lovely things? Well, you know. Surely what some mistake. <laughs> well, the, the lovely menacing they're things lovely that us. Dennis gets they're lovely up to. They're lovely to us and they're lovely to you you guys are gonna absolutely love them so you know dennis celebrates being a kid and you know the best time for a kid's christmas so dennis celebrates christmas very much as well and you know one of the ways he celebrates and this is maybe something stephen can do better than me because see stephen not only writes great books but he can also act and he can sing and he can dance and i, and I hope i'm not giving away too many secrets stephen but you know dennis loves christmas songs but he doesn't always sing the words you may expect. That's very true. <laughs> and there's one in the book, and, and Stephen won't be able to remember it, I don't think, because <laughs> he, he's, you know, he's been so busy writing books. But I think we could have a bit of fun maybe making up words to a Christmas song. You Absolutely. Know? And, 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 do you know, I, I would like to start because Stephen gave me the idea for this, guys. And, and I'm not taking the blame. And if my mum listens to this, this wasn't my idea. This is Stephen Butler's sense of humour, mum. Honest. Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer <laughs> had a very shiny bum. <laughs> That's Stephen's sense of humour, guys, and you're going to absolutely love it. Have you got any Christmas songs that Dennis White sang? Well, I know that there's one in the book he does a little, because he has a teacher mm. called Mrs. Creature, and he's not a big fan of her. And um, and he writes the new lyrics to Jingle Bells. And off the top of my head, because I don't have it in front of me, mm -hmm. but it goes something like this. It goes, Jingle Bells, Creature Smells, of Bug Spray and of Wee. Okay. Santa got a shock when he came down the chimney. I think chimney? Goes, yeah, like that's that. brilliant. Yeah, it's you can, <laughs> do you know what? That's fantastic. That you're there. a master of your like craft. That. So you didn't just give it to your friend to write this book, Stephen. That's a confirmed <laughs> note. I've but, got a future uh, as a lyricist. <laughs> yeah, well, and do you know, the, the, that's only the first verse. You can see the second verse in the book because it gets even funnier than that yes. and even cheekier than that. And, you know, that's a great thing to do this Christmas time. Now, I never told <clears> you this. <throat> Stephen Butler told you this. Remember, there if you any are. of your you teachers ask, me. any of your teachers ask, if you're singing at school assembly or, or you know, if you're going in and, you know, singing in the church choir or, or stuff at Christmas time, try and see how many funny little words you can get into the, the Christmas carols this year. Have a very menacing Christmas carol concert and see what you can do and you know make sure we find out let us know what you get up to and, and we'd love to see you know and tell Dennis about what you came up with because if, if he thinks he inspired you to come and sing these menacing Christmas songs I think he would be very proud <laughs> Merry Christmas <laughs> Merry Christmas Stephen well, Who's that at the door? Someone rather famous has just popped in to show off his new present Yep it's Greg Heffley, a.k.a. the Wimpy Kid. He's got a magic eight ball for Christmas. Let's see if it works. I hope the batteries were included. The way you use the magic eight ball is by asking it a question, then shaking it and waiting for your answer to appear in a little window at the back. I was curious to see if it actually worked, so I gave it a try. I thought up a question and concentrated real hard then gave the magic eight ball a good shake. Am I the smartest person in my family? A few seconds later, this is what showed up in the little window. It is certain. I have to say, I was pretty impressed. But I needed to ask this thing a few more questions to make sure it was for real. And every single time... It was right on the money. Even when I tried to throw it for a loop, I got an answer that seemed pretty reasonable. What's the grossest thing I've ever accidentally eaten? Better not tell you now. Then I realized this thing wasn't only good for answering questions. I could ask it for advice, too. I started by asking the magic eight ball if I should take a shower 
and if I really needed to finish the outline for my science fair project. I got a yes on the hygiene issue, but the Magic 8 Ball totally let me off the hook in my project. My sources say no. See, this is what's been missing my whole life. Now that I've got something to help me make all the little decisions, I'm free to focus on the important stuff. I could do with one of those when I'm choosing between Great Auntie Butler's Technicolor Christmas jumpers. Oh, and that extract was from his eighth diary, Hard Luck. Now, it's time for the Queen's Speech, and here is Penguin Children's top five tips for having a right royal Christmas. Number one, get the valet to warm up your Christmas jumpers before putting it on. Number two, get the butler to take the dogs for a walk in the afternoon. Number three, avoid the in-laws, palace at all cost. Number four, don't forget to wear your crown at dinner. Cracker crowns are acceptable though. Number five, watch the Queen's speech or else you're in trouble. And while we're on the subject of the Queen, did you know the one and only Peppa Pig once met the Queen? Honest, it's the truth. Listen to this. In another fancy room, there is a lady sitting on a throne, knitting. Hello. Peppa says. Have you seen the Queen today? She's an old lady with a crown on her head, says Susie Sheep. I am the Queen, the lady says. Hello, Mrs. Queen, says Peppa. Are you the boss of all the world? Asks Danny Dog. Not quite, says the Queen. Do you tell people what to do? Asks Pedro Pony. Can you make teachers disappear? Asks Susie Sheep. Oh, so many questions. Is it entirely wrong to say that Christmas dinner is more important than the presents themselves? I know, <laughs> controversial. But just think of the stuffing, those roasties, that gravy, and of course, the tasty turkey. All washed down with a glass of your finest bubbles. Speaking of turkeys, have you met William yet? He's got friends in high places, don't you know? Over to Emma Thompson, star of one of our all-time favourite Christmas movies, Love Actually, and the author of The Christmas Tale of Peter Rabbit, to introduce you to William the Turkey. So we're here in Coniston at Yew Tree Farm which is a National Trust property. And that's a very good thing because you can really trust them to look after old things. That's probably why they're called the National Trust now I come to think of it. Perhaps they'd look after me, because I'm very old. Yew Tree Farm was built ages ago in 1693. In the 1930s, it was bought by one of the most interesting women who's ever lived. She was very clever. So I was lucky enough to come here and visit last year and while I was here I met this very interesting person. So interesting, in fact, so curiously fascinating, I actually wrote him into my new Peter Rabbit book. Now I suppose I should give you a couple of clues about this very special person. He's very handsome, very sort of regal and if I'm honest he is a little bit full of himself but I I like that. Hello. <laughs> Hello, William. It's so exciting to see you. I've really been looking forward to this. Hmm? No, we did. We did ring. We, we rang your agent. We arranged this. We, it's been arranged for weeks. <laughs> you look fine. You look absolutely fine. Look at me. I'm just wearing my old dungarees. You look magnificent. I've got some great news, William. I hope you'll be as excited as I am, because I... Well, the fact is, I've written you into my new Peter Rabbit book. Yeah, aren't you excited about that? William, you're about to become the most famous turkey on the face of the planet. Let me tell you the story. Mr and Mrs McGregor 
um, have invited you, as it were, to their Christmas dinner. You're going to be their guest, if you see what I mean. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to RSVP. No, I'm, 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 not on the, I'm not on the guest list. I'm not in it. I'm not in the book. I've written it. I'm not in the book. I'm not coming to the... It's just a story, William. It's just a story. It's not actually happening. It's got talking rabbits in it as well. Well, it, I, I think it could work, actually. What? Children like turkeys more than they like rabbits. Anyway, so it's also going to feature your very good friends, Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny. And they are going to save you. No, 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 not shave. Save you, William, save you, not shave. Where would they get a razor from? Why would rabbits want to shave a turkey? I think this could take longer than I thought. No wonder Beatrix steered clear of turkeys. Do you pull your crackers before or after Christmas dinner? Here on the Penguin Podcast, we're pulling them after the turkey. <laughs> Sorry, William. Right. I have my paper crown, my miniature toy, and a whole load of wonderfully pun-filled jokes. Let's see if we've got any crackers. Why don't reindeers have uncles? Because they only have antlers. Which planet is covered in icing? Marzipan. Why did the banana go to the doctor? Because he wasn't peeling well. Did you hear the one about the two silkworms who had a race? It ended in a tie. <laughs> well, those were well and truly awfully brilliant. After all that eating, we're feeling a little whacked. Definitely time for a bit of R&R &R in front of the TV with a bit of Christmas Day film viewing. See if you can guess what we're watching from this awesome movie trailer. We'll give you a clue. The star is half boy, half god, all hero. I learned that the gods of Olympus are real. And sometimes they have children with humans, called half-bloods. We're pretty much like anyone else you'd meet. But with a few notable differences. We live in the only place that is safe for our kind. Until now. Who would do this? Kronos. The original Titan, father to the Olympians. Destroyer of Olympus. Luke. I will resurrect Kronos. And the Olympians will know death. Then every demigod will be killed within days, if not sooner. The only thing that has the power to save our home is the Golden Fleece. It's in the Sea of Monsters, what the humans call the Bermuda Triangle. Our quest calls for only our finest hero. The best of us. Percy Jackson. Just try not to screw up anything too badly. Where we're going, it's very dangerous. This is a bad idea. We'll find the fleece. It's a chariot of damnation. It looks like a New York City cab. Same difference. Exactly. Please. They don't have eyes. That was awesome. Excuse me, we're looking for Hermes. A little insulted you didn't recognize me. Your son's destined to destroy Olympus. Oh, what has that boy of mine gotten himself into now? We really need your help, and we don't have a lot of time. You twist the cap off this, you release the winds from the four corners of the world. Whoa, 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 no, not in here. Not in here? You destroy the whole world just to get back at your dad. They don't care about us. Them, they're just kids. 
meant to be told what to do. Percy! Hang on to something. Join me, Percy. It's what you were meant to do. I make my own destiny. Tell me those aren't sharks. Those aren't sharks. He rises. It is, of course, Percy Jackson during his second adventure, Sea of Monsters, which you'll be able to buy to watch in the comfort of your own home from December 9th. Jeepers, those sharks make Jaws look like a piddly little sardine. By now, you'll have a roaring fire going. No doubt the cold turkey sandwiches have come out and it's time to settle down on the sofa for some choice televisual entertainment. I'm sat here with Puffin and Ladybird, penguins in the armchair, of course, and we're all set for an intergalactic trip with the Time Lord himself. The Doctor was still circling around the console, fruitlessly trying to work out what was happening when the TARDIS started making the familiar whooshing, screeching noise again. Great, said Ace, relieved. You fixed it. No, Ace, I did not, replied the Doctor. But... That noise means that we're materialising and landing, doesn't it? Well, yes. The TARDIS is performing an auto-land. Sorry? The supernova hurled us across space and time. Now the TARDIS has locked onto some solid-looking planet and is going to land. OK, said Ace. So where and when are we? Haven't a clue. That's why we're landing. We need repairs. These instruments are misbehaving so badly that I can't... There was a colossal bump as the TARDIS completed its automatic landing. Then a brief silence before the familiar electronic burbling noise as the door opening mechanism started up. Professor, don't you think you should work out where and when we are before you open the doors? Just to be on the safe side, suggested Ace. The doctor was already lounging for a switch on the console, but too late. The doors swung open. The Doctor and Ace exchanged a look, then turned tentatively towards the wide open doorway. Sunlight, intense and bright, streamed into the TARDIS, and the sounds of children's laughter and singing came from outside. Doesn't sound too scary, said Ace hopefully. No matter how often they did this, and how many new places they visited, this part always made Ace's heart beat just that little bit faster. The doctor seemed less reassured. Hmm. The way the TARDIS is behaving is deeply disturbing, he said. It's almost as if we were pulled here. I wonder... The doctor returned to the console and bent to examine one of the instruments, so he didn't see it. But Ace did. A Dalek. It glided swiftly through the open doors and into the TARDIS. Ace froze. She remembered her last encounter with these death-dealing robots with evil mutated monsters inside and not with fondness. The thing was only a couple of metres away and temporarily distracted by the hat stand near the door. But now that it saw no threat from the Doctor's Panama hat and umbrella, its Cyclops' eye swivelled towards Ace. She was defenceless, caught in the open, halfway between the console and the door. No bombs, no baseball bat, nothing. The iris on the eye stick widened, adjusting to the relative dark of the TARDIS after the bright sunlight. It started gliding towards her. Doctor! Oi, Puffin, can you come out from behind the sofa now? I think he got a bit scared, not like brave little ladybird. Phew, what a day it's been. After all the presents, food, TV and excitement of Christmas Day, there's nothing better than a bedtime story. And who better to tell it than the wonderful Julia Donaldson? <laughs> Here she is with an extract from the further adventures of the Owl and the Pussycat. The Owl and the Pussycat went to sleep 
by the light of the moon so pale. Their beautiful ring was tied with string in a bow round the pussycat's tail. They dreamed of mice and raspberry ice while slumbering cheek to cheek. But down flew a crow who unravelled the bow and flew off with the ring in his beak. His beak, his beak, and flew off with the ring in his beak. Sounds like penguins nodded off. That's it from me, Stephen Butler. Merry Christmas from us all here at the Penguin Podcast. Good night to all, and to all a good night. Listening to the Penguin Podcast.